Welcome viewers to our session focusing on critical raw materials. This forms part of our one-to-one -one mining investment EMEA online event for autumn 2020. I'm pleased to host Jack Bedder, who's Director of Research at Roskill Information Services. And Roskill is one of the leading analyst providers for the metals and specialty materials uh, industry. And Jack is uh, an expert in analyzing the economics and uh, economics of natural resources. So we're in great hands to be hearing all about uh, critical raw materials and some of the challenges across uh, the value chain there. So uh, Jack, delighted to have you presenting your analysis with us today. And I'll hand over to you to take us through. Great, thanks very much, Adam. Um, yeah, thank you very much uh, to one-to-one to -one mining investment for in inviting me to speak here today. Uh, as Adam said, my name is Jack Bedder. I'm Director of Research at Roskill. And for the next 20, 25 minutes or so, I'm going to be talking about critical raw materials. So I'll just skip ahead to an overview. So uh, in terms of today's presentation, uh, I'll start with a quick introduction to Roskill for those not too familiar with us. I'll then kick off with a brief history of the debate on critical materials um, before moving on to a review of international approaches. And then given the focus of, of this one-to-one -one event, I'll, I'll focus in um, on the critical materials agenda in the EU uh, before finishing with an outlook uh, for Europe in the context of new uh, policies and plans. Right, so just a few uh, words about Roskill before we uh, get going. So we are the leader in critical and specialty materials market analysis. As you can see from the map on the slides, uh, we have representation across the world and are headquartered in London. There are four core areas to the, the Roskill offer. The first, and perhaps for which we're best known, uh, is our market reports. We, we put out market reports on about 30 different critical materials market each year, and also have uh, various reports focused more at the upstream and uh, downstream uh, end uses as well. We have a bespoke uh, consulting offer, um, either strategic consulting aimed at the executive level. We also do lots of work um, supporting markets and feasibility studies. And we also do a, a good deal of research focused on so socioeconomic impact analysis. We have a dedicated cost and sustainability division um, doing a lot of supply cost analysis focused mainly on the battery raw materials space, but increasingly on the steel alloy space as well. And that division is also soon to launch uh, a series of sustainability monitors and analysis products focused on ESG, um, principally targeting lithium, uh, and then with plans to move into cobalt and nickel. Finally, we have a events arm, um, which does a number of things. Firstly, um, some traditional paid for conferences. Secondly, some um, on the road networking events, as we term them. And um, <clears throat> finally, some webinars and online events as well. In terms of our raw material cover, as you can see from the image on the, the right of this slide, between our regular reporting and our consulting offer, we have most of the periodic table covered. And on the right, or sorry, on the left-hand side of the slides, you can see how we uh, segment this into four key divisions, steel alloys, EV raw materials, copper and tech metals, and industrial minerals. And the uh, commodities listed there are just some of the annual reports that we'll be putting out in 2020. So let's uh, move on to talk uh, about critical materials. So how we define something as, as critical or, or scarce is, of course, subjective. Nothing is innately critical. So it's a socioeconomic construct shaped by context over time. So all I've done on this slide is just try to set out a, a timeline of how the resource scarcity or how the critical materials agenda has sort of developed um, with a particular focus on Europe over the last couple of hundred years. So moving from left to right, I think you can trace the origins of this debate back to the 18th century and the writings of the British classical economists, the likes of Adam Smith, uh, John Stuart Mill, whose principal preoccupation uh, was over the availability of food, whether there'd be enough food to sustain the ever-growing human population. Moving on to the 19th century, the debate focused more on coal, whether there'd be enough of the raw materials we need to fuel the industrial production and the industrial revolution that was, was taking place. So these were the early conversations about resource scarcity, whether there'd be enough 
food to sustain human growth, whether there'd be enough coal to sustain industrialization. But in the 20th century, the debate took on a clear military and economic perspective. And that really happened after the First World War. In that war, there was a notable shortage of, of tungsten, um, which is very important for munitions, uh, amongst the Allied forces because Germany had all of the productive capacity for tungsten. So this really set the scene as to moving the debate on and, and focusing the preoccupations on whether there'd be enough of the raw materials that were needed to sustain the, the war effort. And that military dimension has never really gone away, but uh, as the as the decades rolled on, we also saw a broadening of the debate. The 1970s saw new computer modeling approaches to scarcity. And a, a very important event in that decade was the oil crisis, which I think really highlighted raw material shortage issues to a, to a much more global audience. Fast forward to the 80s and 90s, and that military definition of critical materials is definitely expanded away from the defense sector and encapsulates more whether there are going to be enough of the metals and minerals required for new technologies and new manufacturing processes. And to an extent, that's very much where we are today, um, a, a preoccupation with new technologies, smartphones, tablets, electric vehicles and, and the like, but also, of course, set against um, some, some interesting geo political tensions, trade wars, um, globalization more broadly, and new trends uh, and new preoccupations such as sustainability. So I started by saying um, it's a subjective issue, critical materials. And I think the last timeline really represented a, a Western view of the debate or a Western history of the debate. So what I've done on this slide is just chart a similar evolution, but with a focus on China. I think it makes sense to go back to the 1950s when we first start to look at critical materials in China. And that's when you first see in the Chinese state media um, a focus on strategic minerals, albeit one really focused on just criticizing the then superpowers at the time, the USA and the USSR and their actions with, with regard to critical materials. It's not really until the 2000s when strategic mineral resource planning becomes a key focus of, of policymakers in China but it very much becomes a, a, a mainstay of the, the narrative in the 2000s. In 2001, Wen Jibao calls for more exploration for strategic minerals. We see the launch of the go out policy where firms are heavily encouraged to invest in raw material assets abroad. There are calls for the establishment of a strategic mineral stockpile in China, which is, is, is duly brought into existence. And by the 2010s, the terms staple mineral, advantageous mineral and strategic emerging mineral all appear in China's five-year plans and in its national mineral resources plans as well. The latest of which, 2016 to 2020, uh, introduces a catalogue of 24 strategic energy, metallic and non-metallic minerals. So if critical materials are subjective, it's, it's no surprise that definitions can be uh, wide ranging. And, and what I've done on the slide here is, is just included a few. The, the one at the top is my own, which sort of broadly defines materials as critical if they're of high economic importance to a particular industry sector or spatial area and are at risk of supply shortage. But this is a, quite a Eurocentric definition. Uh, some of the other um, quotations on the, on the slide here capture some other elements of what might deem a material as critical in, in certain contexts. I've got one there from the Critical Minerals Association, which highlights um, future technologies as, as a key element of this. Maybe it's it's about the materials which will be important in the future, uh, not so much today. Uh, they also highlight defense and, and diplomatic and strategic minerals as well. Um, looking down the slide, sustainability and substitutability are, are also key factors in defining certain raw materials as, as critical by certain actors. And at the bottom there as well, uh, having an abundance of certain minerals, having a competitive advantage is also a, a key part of what defines a critical material if indeed the actor in question is, is the sort of actor that has um, large mineral reserves, the likes of China, Canada, Australia. So those slides were really just intending to, to set the scene and set out where the critical materials debate came from and what critical materials are. And I'll move on now to just look at some um, recent international approaches. 
So to start with the USA, it was it was back in 2008 when its National Research Council published its first um, major piece on critical minerals. But since then, uh, this agenda has remained a key area of focus. In December 2017, President Trump signed a presidential executive order on a federal strategy to ensure secure and reliable supplies of critical minerals. And in 2018, the US Department of the Interior published a list of 35 mineral commodities considered critical to its economic and national security. And of course, this was published amidst the context of escalating trade tensions between the US and China, uh, which resulted in the imposition of tariffs uh, on, on both sides. So in the US, certainly, as, as part of the, the rhetoric of the Trump executive, um, critical materials has, has remained um, front and center. Across the border in Canada, um, in early 2020, so early this year, the Canadian Minerals and Metals Plan was published, which refers to critical materials in, in several contexts. Canada is yet to launch a, a clear critical material strategy, but this is a, a key consideration and priority for various government agencies uh, in Canada. So I think we can probably expect one over the next couple of years. In China, as I set out earlier, the National Mineral Resources Plan 2016 to 20 introduced a catalog of 24 strategic minerals um, classed as staple minerals, advantageous minerals, and strategic emerging industry minerals. And in Australia, we saw the publication of a critical mineral strategy last year and just a couple of weeks ago, an updated Australian critical minerals prospectus, uh, which really sets out Australia's position as having um, lots of mineral assets and resources in this space uh, and very much highlighting the fact that Australia is, is open for business. Elsewhere, I've uh, highlighted a few other countries that have put forward studies and strategies, the likes of Finland, Germany, the Netherlands, South Korea and Sweden, um, and countless others as well. And important to note that these studies haven't all sort of gone on in, in national isolation. There's been a lot of international cooperation in this space. Um, for example, there's been a Canadian-US joint action plan on critical minerals collaboration and similar discussions at the sort of EU-US-Japan level uh, as well. So I'll move on to talk about how some materials have been deemed as critical or not critical when we focus in on the EU in a second. But on this slide, I've just set out some key critical materials that come up in a, a lot of the international studies I've just spoken about. So we've got the most recent Australia publication, the one for the European Commission, China, Japan, and the US. And, and what it shows is there are a lot of what I've termed the, the usual suspects here, similar metals and minerals popping up on, on lots of these different lists and rankings. And that's for a number of reasons, uh, not least because the methodologies used by, by some of these regions and countries is, is quite similar. Uh, I've put some stars above uh, just a, a few of these, the, the ones that the critical materials that pop up on, on all of these lists. So antimony, cobalt, graphite, lithium, rare earths, and, and tungsten, perhaps the uh, sort of poster children of the critical material space, at least for the moment. So let's move on to, to focus uh, a little bit more on the EU. So revisiting the, the timeline approach, um, what I've shown here is just that Europe has been looking at critical materials for the, the best part of a decade. And I, I've used the timeline approach here just to, to chart that evolution. So it all gets kicked off in 2008, uh, where it's deemed that um, the a raw materials initiative requ requires the publication of a, a sort of critical list. So in 2011, a list of 14 critical materials is published by the, the European Commission, which commits to updating the list uh, at least every three years to reflect uh, changes uh, in, in markets. Uh, and duly, this happens in 2014. We see an update of the, uh, the EC list, which expands the list of critical materials to, to 20. A third list is published in 2017. Uh, based on a slightly revised methodology um, and an expanded list of candidate materials, which um, in, in conjunction means the, the final list of critical materials is expanded to 27. And this year, 2020, saw the fourth installment uh, in, in the series. So the 2020 assessment follows the same methodology as in 2017, uh, looking at a, a larger list of, of candidate materials, 83 in total. And uh, I'll, I'll present the findings of that in, in just a second. <laughs> 
So in terms of how does the European Commission classify a material as critical, um, it applies what I would term a sort of criticality matrix approach, approach where you have uh, supply risk on, on one axis and economic importance on another. So the EEC uses these two factors as the main parameters to define criticality. So what do those two things mean? Well, economic importance looks at the allocation of raw materials to key end uses um, based on industrial applications, and it does that within a, a European context. And supply risk looks at the country level concentration of, of global production of primary materials and sourcing to the EU, but it also looks at the governance of the countries in question. It takes into account environmental aspects, uh, the contribution of recycling, whether these materials have uh, viable substitutes, and it also looks at uh, import reliance and trade restrictions. The map on the bottom right of the slide just shows uh, some of the shares of global production uh, for some of the metals that the uh, European Commission deems as critical for Europe. So these percentages really relate to um, some of the key reasons uh, as to why um, some of these materials are deemed of high supply risk. So if we look at the, the rare earths in China, for example, the, using the EC's data, at least the rare earth production in China is up in the high uh, 90%. Uh, another example, niobium there in Brazil, where, where CBMM is the major producer, uh, production up at 85%. So this is the uh, European Commission list from, from 2020, um, mainly similar to, to the, the previous iteration, but I've highlighted the, the four new materials. So we've got bauxite, lithium, strontium and, and titanium. And apologies for the low resolution of, of this image, which I've lifted from the, the European Commission website, but the, the chart at the bottom sets out the criticality matrix for Europe in 2020. So you've got economic importance on the, on the X axis and supply risk on the Y. So the further to the right of the chart, the more economically important a metal is. In this case, it deems tungsten the, the most important. And the closer to the top of the chart, the higher the supply risk. And there you've got the light rare earths. So anything in the top right uh, hand side sort of quadrant there, the ones colored red are those deemed as critical in 2020 uh, and the blue ones uh, at the bottom left hand side are, are deemed non-critical uh, this time around. So to finish, what does this all mean for Europe? What's the outlook in Europe in the context of its latest list and some of its new policies and plans? So the European Commission intends, or it, it states that it intends that its critical material study should help to do an, a number of things. And I've set these out on the slide. So firstly, strengthen the competitiveness of European industry in, in line with its industrial strategy, stimulate the production of critical materials uh, within Europe, foster the efficient use and recycling of critical materials, increase awareness of potential raw material supply risks and related opportunities, and be used to help negotiate trade agreements, challenge trade distortion, um, and develop research and innovation actions and implement sustainable development goals. So to what extent has this been the case? My contention is probably that while raw material supply risks have certainly been promoted by the EC's agenda, other aims of its critical materials agenda have not yet been met. I think it's fair to say that so far, at least, European policymakers probably haven't much advanced the debate much past beyond the sort of definitional phase. And it's very important to do so. Um, it's only by doing so can strategies be formulated and applied so that the, the EU can help further its industrial strategy, help cut greenhouse gas emissions, help achieve climate neutrality goals, all of these things. So it's very important to move away from, from rhetoric and by you know, sort of creating these criticality lists and actually move towards meaningful policy action. And to its credit, the EC as of 2020 now does seem to be taking steps towards this. So it's launched a new industry alliance aimed at building a complete EU supply chain for raw materials, vital to renewable energy, EVs and the circular economy. There's going to be an industry driven process whose task will be to identify opportunities and barriers and to create relevant investment cases. The European Commission is also pledged to strengthen its work to develop robust evidence and scenario planning on, on raw material supply demand uh, and, and use for strategic sectors. And the EC's asserted um, that 
the European Union should act to urgently ensure a secure, sustainable supply of raw materials, uh, pooling the efforts of companies and, and various other EU institutions and, actions, and actors. And it notes um, at the bottom of the slide here that, that an EU action plan for critical materials should do four things, develop resilient value change uh, for EU industrial ecosystems, reduce dependency on primary critical materials, uh, strengthen the sustainable and responsible domestic sourcing and processing of raw materials in the EU, and diversify supply uh, with sustainable and, and responsible sourcing. Of these four points, I think point three is the one that's probably of most interest to, to, to lots of people. Um, this sees one of the key actions is identifying mining and processing projects and investment needs and related financing opportunities for critical materials in the EU that can be operational by 2025. So perhaps for the first time, the EU talking about making investment and financing available for projects that have some, some near-term viability. So together, all of the things on, these, on this slide, I think represent positive action plans for the European Commission, for the European Union, but a lot of work is still to be done in my opinion, if the critical materials agenda is to gather some momentum, move past a definitional stage and is characterized more in the future by, by meaningful policy action. So with that, thank you uh, very much uh, for your attention and thanks again to, to One to One for inviting me to speak. Thanks, Jack, thanks very much. That's great stuff. Um, I've just got a couple of questions actually. Let's, um, let, let, to add to some of your excellent slides there, and um, it's a really good uh, uh, way to introduce this with the genesis of, uh, of, of thinking behind what materials are critical in West and in China, um, and, and how that's very much been a moving or evolving um, um, agenda, if you like. Um, mm. First of all, I wanted to um, come to uh, your point around um, something around industrial applications um, that you see that might be driving the demand for these um, critical raw materials. Now, obviously, there's a lot on the list, um, thinking particularly about the EU um, uh, list of critical raw materials. But um, would uh, are you broadly in agreement um, with the, the top um, ones that they highlighted um, as most critical in terms of um, the economics and the supply? Um, and what's the Roskill view um, towards those? Would you perhaps add or highlight any others that maybe the EU's not focused on, or are you broadly in agreement with that? Um, and then also, could you tell us a bit about the industrial applications that are creating this demand that's going to um, 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 increase in the next 10 years or so? Sure. Um, well, yeah, I mean, I think... In, in terms of the way it, it creates a list, the, the EU's methodology is, is fit for purpose. So it sort of looks at economic importance as defined by sort of material consumption in, in key mega sectors in, in Europe, and then looks at supply risk on the, on the other axis. So I, I don't have a particular issue with the way um, that it, it sets it out, but uh, the methodology does have some some deficiencies and i suppose if done differently could uh could result in some different materials uh making the list uh on the supply risk side i think there's there's too much maybe concentration on um mine production as, as opposed to sort of refine and, and processing um capacity so so that may be one deficiency um but broadly speaking i, I think the the results of the list uh, are are sensible um and quite clearly given what I was saying at the start of my presentation, the narrative in, in, in Europe around critical materials is one of import dependency and a lack of, um, a lack of domestic supply. It would be very different in some other parts of the world. Um, in terms of the, the key sectors that are driving this, um, the sectors that are driving the results of the, the EC study are based on the methodology are, are probably just Europe's biggest sectors. So steel would be very, very important as, as would numerous other sectors. But I think some of the key interesting supply chains and sectors to watch as part of this space uh, moving forward. I mean, certainly electric vehicles uh, is, is one, and you know, Europe's looking to become a, a center of electric vehicle 
production and consumption and move more of those supply chains over from Asia to here. So some of those raw materials, lithium, cobalt, uh, nickel, manganese, um, graphite, uh, should be very, very much of, of interest there. Uh, other other key sort of end use markets, I would say aerospace, um, of which a, a wide variety of, of weird and wonderful critical materials are, are of course consumed in, in aerospace applications. Uh, other key end use markets, I would say probably um, things like 5G and, and, and developments in, in that sort of space. Um, other sustainable industries, photovoltaic, solar, things like that, also, also ones to watch. And aside from that, I, the steel market is still important, particularly perhaps uh, niche steel applications, um, special steels, things like that, all of which uh, do consume a lot of exotic uh, critical materials. Yep, absolutely. Okay, excellent. Um, that's good to get um, some view there. Um, as a sort of like counterpoint to the EU's plan or perhaps a challenge, if you like, um, it was interesting what you highlighted as their third point around um, uh, bring increasing sourcing and processing of materials in the EU. Um, isn't there a conflict, though, um, in clawing back control of parts of the industrial supply chain and the processing side of things um, that conflicts with the environmental standards that the EU likes to uphold? Um, isn't there an idea that, you know, um, reindustrializing the EU might conflict with um, other policies um, or other national agendas around greening the EU, as it were? Yeah, I completely agree. There's there's a tension there. Um, and lots of these supply chains that we seem set upon developing to move uh, to, towards a more sustainable economy, electric vehicles are a good case in point, are quite carbon intensive uh, in terms of their production. So, um, you know, graphite's a good example, quite coal intensive. Um, I'm not sure there'd be too much European appetite for moving uh, too much uh, mine production or processing capacity for certain raw materials uh, within within Europe's borders. So there's certainly a tension there, as you set out, and it'll be interesting to see if and how it resolves itself. Yeah, um, but to, to flip onto the sort of positive story, though, there are some good um, projects, uh, mining projects within uh, the EU. Are you following any of those in particular? Are there any any projects of note that you would you would mention that are sort of helping the EU move towards this plan um, at, at a good rate? Sure. I mean, I, I, yeah, at Roscoe, we sort of cover 30, 40 different materials and we're tracking all of the projects uh, very closely. Uh, I'd say that there are a number of, of interesting projects within, within this space, particularly, I'd say, on the sort of EV battery raw material side. Um, I wouldn't necessarily... Uh, like to name names, but uh, I, I think there are certainly some interesting projects um, that could, you know, be viable uh, in and before sort of 2025 that, that that could do with more investment and focus. I wouldn't say they're just at the upstream. I'd say, you know, that there are also some processing and recycling projects that could could really perhaps do with support and investment. And I think that's probably the challenge for Europe to to pinpoint the areas in which it has some comparative and competitive advantage and to support the the industries it already has and some of the projects around that might not be necessarily just by investing in domestic production within european borders but but maybe strengthening some of the other skills that europe can bring to this uh these sorts of global supply chains yeah certainly um okay so uh, what do you feel around investment into the space then you did mention it um briefly in the presentation um Certainly there's renewed input from government on a policy side and perhaps on a tax advantage size. Um, are, you, are you expecting more government funding to come into projects that align with these agendas? And separately from that, do you look at the private set, um, capital that goes into uh, these projects as well? As to whether there'll be more government funding available, I, I, I guess we'll have to, to wait and see. But um... You know, as I set out in the presentation, it, it does seem that the European Commission is is talking in, in that direction. So perhaps we should expect that, that more investment should be forthcoming. Uh, certainly, uh, I think uh, a handful of, uh, of national governments uh, are also likely to, to make some in investment or at least um, make the environment for investments in, in some of these key areas uh, more, more attractive. 
I, I think one of the key, the key areas here, I suppose you, you, you touched on it with your, your previous question is, um, you know, this is all going hand in hand with, with a move towards sort of more ESG led investment. And I think that's what we're already seeing, uh, sort of, you know, a grassroots driven focus on, on green, more sustainable investments. And, and I think that these are two sort of narratives that are going hand in hand, really. So a bigger focus on, on ESG factors and investment, a bigger focus on critical materials in, in Europe and security of supply. And it'll be interesting to see how these sort of uh, these two narratives interlock and, and progress going forward. Um, excellent stuff. Well, look, uh, Jack, thank you very much for your presentation. It's a really good overview of where things stand um, and where the EU is positioned um, for, for further development and opportunity. And I'm very pleased to have you presenting for us for one-to-one -one money investment, EMEA. Thanks very much, Adam. Yeah, and thanks very much for the, for the invitation. Cheers.